I, I think we're good. Yeah, I think it's steady. Yep. All right, I will call the meeting to order. And if we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Yep. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, to the Republic for, which it, for stands, which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. For all. And I would like to start the meeting with a moment of silence for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was an absolute absolutely amazing attorney, woman, member of our society. And um, we are all mourning her death, I do believe. So if we could have a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Okay, so our first business is approval of the minutes um, for August 26th and September 3rd. So can I get a motion to approve August 26th meeting minutes? So oh, go ahead. Second. Uh, uh, any discussion? All no. in favor? Shannon? Aye. Julia? Aye. Matt? Aye. Peter? Aye. Kelly? Aye. Okay, and then a motion for the September 3rd, 2020 meeting minutes. I move to approve the meeting minutes for September 3rd, 2020. Second. All in favor, Shannon. Aye. Julia. Aye. Matt. Aye. Peter. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Okay, um, reports for the school committee. We've got um, Dr. Antonucci up first. Yeah, so I actually, I just put a couple of slides together. Um, just give me one second here. Yep. A little slow, sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, put, I just, I, I kind of put a few slides together um, to uh, talk about our, our back to school efforts. Um, you know, as you all know, we're, we, we made it. It's, uh, it was uh, quite a monumental lift to, to get us where we are today, um, but we're really, uh, really excited um, to be back in school. And so I just want to share a few points um, of what's working, um, what are some challenges that we still have ahead, and then just kind of sh show you some visuals to give you a sense of, um, of, of what the school year is looking like. Um, so if you'll uh, indulge me here. So as far as what's working well, as I said, we're open. Um, and I, I don't think we should take that for granted. Um, we actually, uh, Duxbury, uh, I think we were one of the first, if not the first district in the Commonwealth to have kids in the building. Um, and uh, many districts are either fully remote uh, or taking multi-weeks, in some cases, multi-month transitions to get kids back in the building. So the fact that we're open, um, I think, is a, is a tribute to our work and also our community's uh, community support. Um, I asked the principals kind of to give me a sense of uh, what's working well in their words and just a few here, you know, and Danielle and I have, uh, Danielle and I have been out in the buildings quite a bit, but, you know, kids are smiling, they're happy to be at school and they seem, they seem to be adjusting very well. Um, you know, kids are very resilient and um, as we all know, and uh, it, it's sort of business as usual for them with obviously a lot of modifications that they may or may not even realize. Um, our faculty and staff, um, you know, they, they're just doing yeoman's work and they're working incredibly hard. Uh, they're being creative, uh, they're being flexible, they're adapting to kind of the new way of life and they're willing to try new things as this says. And so I couldn't be prouder of the effort of our faculty and staff. Um, it, it's really challenging. It, it, it is, it is, it's unbelievable what we're asking uh, public educators to do right now, um, but it's, they're doing a great job. 
Um, teachers obviously, you know, as the weeks go on are getting more comfortable with uh, supporting and engaging the students who are in front of them and the students who are at home. Uh, and that and that is, it's a new way of life. It, it's a huge uh, challenge and it takes a lot of effort, but you know, every day that goes by, they're getting more and more comfortable with that. Kind of shifting gears, um, our custodians um, under the leadership of Brian Cherry and our maintenance staff, uh, the changes we've made um, both with our cleaning regimens and we've actually adjusted some of our, how we're staffing the buildings. Um, our buildings are clean and disinfected uh, and everything's running really smooth. So I just wanted, I wanted to kind of point that out and acknowledge their work. Same goes for our buses. Uh, Katie Blake's been in instrumental here. Um, you know, she's working every day with our bus company and, you know, we'll talk about this at a later meeting, but because we only have um, half the students, uh, we made significant modifications to our bus routes. We've actually gone from 21 buses to 14 buses. And we'll talk about the implications of that at, at a future meeting. Um, but, you know, besides some typical beginning of the year hiccups, our buses are running great. Uh, and so we, we appreciate Katie's work and, as well as for our students and our, and our bus drivers. Um, these are all kind of random, but students are doing a great job with mask wearing. We've had zero issues. Um, it just, you know, for all the concern about that, kind of in society and in the community, the, the students and staff, we, the, it, absolutely, absolutely no, no, uh, no issues with wearing masks. Um, our lunches are working. Um, you know, some are in classes, uh, some are in other, other um, spaces. Um, but they're, they don't feel normal, um, but they're, as I say here, they're structured, the kids are behaving very well. Um, and I think really importantly, the kids are loving that time to kind of take a break um, from the mass and socialize kind of in a more normal atmosphere with their, with their peers. At the elementary level, just a couple of random points. Um, we've had to completely revise our drop off and dismissal routines. Um, some of that was COVID related, some of that was, um, just related to some improvements or principals wanted to make, but they're working quite well and they've been very well received by, by the parents. Um, and um, same thing at the elementary, our classroom teachers were, were seeing some great creativity and, and um, hard work at kind of connecting um, the uh, in-person and, and, and remote students with their, in the morning and afternoon meetings. And they've already established great routines and they're trying to build community and uh, establish relationships with these with these really three cohorts, cohort A, B, and C. Um, so those are some very quick highlights. I probably could go on, um, but I, I'll, say, I'll say this, it feels kind of normal. Um, it's not normal. Uh, we've had to make tremendous modifications to our learning model. Um, and we have a whole host of um, kind of changes that we've had to adopt um, to, just, to just get open. But for the most part, it feels like school. There's teaching happening, there's learning happening, and uh, it's fun. It, it really is. Um, so now I'll talk about the challenges in a few minutes, uh, but I just want to show you a few pictures to give you a sense of um, kind of what our buildings look like. Um, I, we've talked about this, it's kind of crazy, but this is the entry to the, the high school. There's hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer everywhere you turn um, in the building. So this is a kind of a normal look as, as you walk through the buildings. This happens to be just one entrance. This, we have several tents that we've had to rent. Um, you'll see them all throughout the district. Um, this is actually right behind me um, at the Chandler School. And here's one of our classroom teachers yesterday, you know, running an outdoor, um, an outdoor class. Um, it's necessary. Um, we, we need the space, you know, for a lot of our classes uh, and the kids just, you know, the kids kind of have to get outside and spread out, um, especially for some, uh, uh, you know, music, physical education, um, not, you know, as well as regular classrooms, but um, it's hard, you know, um, it's gonna get cold very fast, but we're gonna, we're just gonna keep rolling with it as long as we can, but you'll see those tents all around the district. It's a significant investment in money and preparation, but uh, we, we just, we just need the space for, for to, to be able to run our full instructional program. You, you'll also see, Pods, um, brand name pods, but also just um, other storage trailers scattered throughout all of our campuses. And what most of them are, 
uh, or, or just pure storage, um, we had to empty, empty out our classrooms, empty out our common areas um, to be able to reasonably accommodate um, the six foot social distancing guideline, right? And, you know, kind of spread kids out. Um, so you'll see storage all throughout the district. This particular pod here on the right is actually music, um, music stands um, music and, and equipment uh, that can be outside for music. Because uh, if you remember our music uh, classes have to be outside uh, per regulation. So I, I kind of want to point this out for a few reasons, but the, what it took to get the building ready just for hybrid was a months long or you know, certainly weeks long, if not months long project. And for us ever to transition back into a full in-person model would be a Herculean effort. And I, I just, this is just one example, um, but it's, it's very real. I mean, we quite literally had to empty our buildings in order to accommodate our students in a, in a hybrid model. Um, so I use this as a very concrete example. There's probably a, you know, a dozen others that are going to make it difficult to, to transition back. But I just wanted to point out these storage containers because they're they're very they're very visible. Um, this is just a this is Danielle in the background. She didn't want to be in my pictures, but she, she happened to be walking by. But uh, this is just an example. This is a team space at the middle school. Um, you'll see these uh, plexiglass dividers. Th this space is set up right now to accommodate kids if we need to keep them indoors for lunch. Ideally, we want the kids to be outdoors as long as we can, but um, because we're not able to, uh, you know, meet the social distancing guidelines without masks and while kids are eating, we needed to put these plexiglass dividers up. So you'll see those at a lot of different places around the building. This is our a couple uh, just quick snapshots of our, our kids eating outdoors. They're doing a pretty good job in these pictures, at least, of uh, the social distancing, and you know they they seem pretty happy. You know, kids are outside all day, every day. This is an example of a science lab in classes where um, we don't have desks where kids are able to sit facing forward, which is a regulation per the state. We've had to uh, put up plexiglass dividers um, to, to sort of meet, you know, meet, meet kind of the state uh, guidelines. So this happens in some of our science labs just because of the, uh, the nature of the science tables. Um, so I just wanted to kind of show that as an example. But Kids are adapting quite quite well to it. This is the the title of the slide says what it is, but this this is just a, a an example of what it takes to kind of blend the in person uh, in in the in the remote. So this is um this is uh, Mr. Mail's classroom. If anybody knows Mr. Mail, but he's he's running, he's streaming his class. Danielle, I believe for the most part every every period, correct? All, all period? Yep, he has his um, students at home projected on the wall. Yep, so his students are here on the projected on the wall. He's got a camera, he's, can you see my cursor by the way? Yeah. So he, he's got a camera um, set up here that's that's filming him. He's got, you can't see it, but the, he's got a microphone set up. So when he talks, he it, it goes directly into the feed for the students at home, but the balancing act uh, that these teachers are having to do to fully engage um, these students in a lesson is, it's unbelievable to watch. And I know I extended an invitation to the school committee and I, I, if you can make it, I'd love you to come in and see it, but um, it's hard to capture brilliance in, in, in a snapshot, but what was happening in this classroom, yeah, you would have been incredibly proud and, and impressed. Um, and this was probably day, day three or day, day four of school. Similarly, we went to another classroom. Um, this is um, Anna uh, Zhu from the high school. And this is, I think, a pre-calc classroom. And uh, you can't really see the class, but she's doing a similar thing where she's connecting the students in front of her and, and uh, fully connecting with the students at home. She's got an, uh, an, an Apple uh, AirPod in one ear. And as she's uh, engaging the class and asking questions of the class, She's fielding answers from the kids in front of her. And then she's fielding answers or questions, I should say too, um, from the students at home through her ear pod, uh, through her AirPod. And so again, it's, it's a balancing act and a juggling act, but 
it's remar it's remarkable that they're able to um, able to do it. Uh, I would just say we should not take for granted the fact that we're we're doing this. Uh, many districts are not even allowing um, uh, they're 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 not allowing a streaming video. We are, and I give 100% credit to our teachers for their willingness to uh, kind of uh, adopt that model um, and also um, work really hard to, you know, um, to, connect, to connect students no matter where, whether they're cohort A, B, or C. Um, so again, this is just a snapshot. You can't really get the feel, but I just wanted you to kind of, I want to point out, you know, what she's doing in that picture. It's, it, was, it was unbelievable. We have a small uh, number of teachers who are working remotely. So they're at home teaching into a classroom, okay? So um, this is Ms. Roselli uh, at the middle school on the right and this is Mrs. Sullivan at the middle school on the, on the left. We have, we've had to staff the rooms with um, instructional assistants and the teachers are working block by block all day, um, teaching remotely into uh, a live, uh, a live uh, the kids, you know, the kids who are live in our school building. Um, and again, you can't capture what's happening, uh, really happening in the class from a picture, but Danielle and I spent pretty much a full class uh, in each of these uh, classes the last few days and um, it's remarkable. Uh, and it's really, really hard work on these teachers part. I do, it's, uh, they probably have the hardest jobs in the district right now, but it's, it's working. But I, I just, I, I pointed out for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, we've had to be extremely flexible to accommodate the, the needs of our, our, our faculty and staff, as well as the needs of our students, but we've had to make a significant investment, um, you know, just to open up. And that's a financial investment. Um, and that's uh, an investment in just being creative and uh, accepting you know, kind of a new way to, to teach and learn. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to point these out. This is fascinating to watch in person, but I, and Danielle can attest to this, but the kids were fully engaged, 100% um, two-way two -way student. Um, and so you should be really proud of our kids too for adapting to this new way. Um, Danielle, anything you want to add on that? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but. Oh, no, it's just, I think that, um... Like you said, it's just you can hear a pin drop in the room, but the teachers are really um, engaging the kids in both groups to be able to answer questions, ask questions in the chat feature. Um, and the kids are really enjoying themselves and the teachers are working really hard to make sure that um, everything's running very smoothly, super organized. And um, I have to say the instructional assistants have gotten really great at managing the Zoom and managing what the students are seeing and changing the view um, to be able to facilitate the learning seamlessly. So it's, it's really great to see. Thank you. Um, so let me just conclude with sort of some challenges that we're, we're still facing and there are going to be many. Um, I don't wanna pretend that everything's um, working smoothly. We, you know, we're upside down as an educational system. So, um, we continue to have significant staffing issues. Um, we're, you know, we're doing a bunch of different things. We're managing uh, uh, kind of COVID related as well as some other related um, accommodations for, for teachers. Um, we have several people on leaves of absences. We're having to backfill those leaves. Um, there are, uh, is an increase in, in sick day usage, not significant, but it's, it's because we can't take any risks. So uh, if someone has any kind of symptoms, you know, we are being ultra conservative in asking both students and in this case staff to stay home if there's any doubt, uh, potentially get tested or what have you. So, uh, that, so that's kind of a, just a, a challenge. We we still we're still filling positions now, and you know we're kind of we're knocking on the end of September. We have a, a huge um, we have a number of vacancies still um, in a in a shortage with instructional assistants. Um, as well as substitute teachers, uh, that that's a statewide issue right now. Um, you know, people have had to add a lot of support staff uh, to their organizations to kind of, again, even using my examples to kind of get up and running and kind of manage the building in a new way. But also substitutes, I just don't think that people want to take the chance to come into a school building for 
you know, for a small paycheck, it was hard to get subs in the in a normal year. So we're really, really struggling um, in that area. Um, you know, Danielle will talk about this a little bit later, but cohort C, um, we knew it was going to be a big challenge. Um, and so the workflow and communication, you know, is a work in progress. Um, we just hired a second teacher to, uh, uh, for our cohort C at Chandler just this week. That uh, speaks to kind of the, the staffing issues that I, I referenced in my first bullet. Um, unrelated to staffing, you know, we still find ourselves having to remind uh, students frequently about social distancing um, during, you know, passing times at the secondary level and also in an unstructured spaces, you know, such as uh, the example I gave here is outdoor lunch. Um, I think that'll just be a constant, you know, throughout the year. Um, you know, our reliance on tech, uh, technology has increased, you know, exponentially, obviously. Um, and, you know, with that, you know, in any, any organization, uh, we still have some outstanding technology needs and some small issues that, you know, that need resolution. Again, I think this is just be an ongoing thing, you know, again, in our, with our reliance on it, so significant, um, you know, anytime there's a little uh, blip for technology, it does, it just does impact our, our work more than ever. Um, afternoon pickup at DMS and DHS uh, is going to require patience. Um, and, you know, we continue to ask for patience and I'll for a lot of different reasons, but it's taking approximately 25 minutes to clear the traffic out of the building. And um, yeah, it's a function of um, more people, more people driving um, and picking up their students from school. Um, and this is kind of what I want to leave with is um, we're, we're hearing already and that, that families uh, and students uh, are not adhering to social distancing guidelines uh, and limitations on group side uh, group sizes uh, you know, outside of the school hours. Um, it's maybe a polite way of saying we know there are parties happening, you know, all throughout town, and this is a, with adults and kids. Um, and you know, to be blunt, I mean, this is going to be our make or break. Uh, and, and if the community, you know, wishes to remain in school, uh, whether it's in a hybrid model, or even for us to remotely consider returning fully in person, it's going to be imperative to limit those parties, you know, limit those social gatherings. Um, and, um, you know, we don't have to look too far to see other examples. And I, I list them here, Dover Sherman, Lincoln Sudbury, Winchester, Dedham, some others uh, have all been forced in a remote um, be, because of uh, parties that have led to, uh, you know, a significant transmission of, of the virus. And um, this will be Duxbury tomorrow. It could be tomorrow um, if habits don't change. And um, you know, I just say this: you know, the the, the balls in our the balls in our community's court. Um, and if they're serious about wanting to be in school, we can have school. We've proven it, and uh, I think we're doing a great job. Um, but I am very concerned about what I'm hearing from even the first weekend um, of school, and we are we are hanging by a thread. And so, I'm not one to, you know, usually give advice to families um, from my seat, but. Uh, we are gonna we are gonna be closed very soon if, if habits don't change, um, and so you know I'll, I'll kind of leave it at, I'll leave it at that. Um, so I'm gonna shift gears a little bit, but are there any questions or comments about the what I just said? I just have one more thing in my superintendent's report, um, but anything on what I these slides I just shared or pictures? I have comments? a question, John. Sure. Um, what happens when we don't have a substitute? Um, I, I don't, Danielle, do you know what we're doing? I mean, I think we're just- so I think um, the middle and high school level, we're having to rely on teachers to volunteer to cover for class periods when they're not currently teaching. I think when, when there's not teachers available to do that, we're having to house students and maybe multiple classes in a cafeteria, of course, social distancing um, in some of those larger spaces. And I think that we've had to get really creative with um, who's covering classes at the elementary level if we don't have the, uh, enough subs to be able to cover. I know the assistant principals and curriculum supervisors have had to step in and teachers that may not be teaching in their subject area, they might have to cover maybe a PE teacher or a school psychologist covering a class until we're able to get coverage. So um, I know that the office staff is working extremely hard each day to make sure that classes are covered. Um, I covered a recess duty the other day for Chandler. So I think that um, it wasn't exactly um, 
it wasn't bad for me. It was probably the best thing I did all day. But uh, I think that everyone's having to just jump in and fill in those holes while we can. But we, we certainly want to look at um, ways we can attract additional substitutes this year. And I think we have some ideas to be able to do that, which we can probably share with you at an upcoming meeting. But um, it's, been, it's been hard. And if you ask any of the main office staff um, what the mornings have been like, they'll tell you that it's been a scramble to get everyone covered so the kids are able to learn throughout the day. Okay, and by coverage, you mean they're getting instruction. They're not yeah. just sitting there. Yep, awesome. absolutely. Okay. And then my only other comment um, popped into my head when you were talking about technology, John. I just want everybody to be mindful, and there's no good answer, it's a pandemic, that these kids, when they're home, three days are on the computer all day long, and then they have to sit on the computer all night long and do homework. Um, so we just maybe need to encourage teachers to be creative with their homework assignments. I don't know. That's all. Thank you. I had a question about attendance. How, are there any, uh, how does it compare to the spring um, so far? And are there any issues arising? You know, I, it's a good question. I haven't heard uh, anything about it. And so I'm, I'm assuming that there, uh, it's, it's been very strong. Danielle, have you heard anything? Yeah, I think that um, on the teacher end, it's, it's become another issue that they're having to um, accommodate that the state is now requiring us to take attendance virtually absent, virtually present, physically present, physically absent. We're also keeping track of our cohort C students and we're finding at the elementary level that um, we're working really hard. I know the classroom teachers are trying to make meaningful interactions for their students in the morning and afternoon session. And we're noticing some of our cohort C students aren't logging in when we're taking attendance. So this is going to be something that the principals and we are all going to have to just reiterate that um, school is important. It's mandatory. We are taking attendance in every session that we're offering live. Um, we had an outcry from families that we, they wanted more live sessions. And so we really need families to attend those, make sure they prioritize having students attend those sessions. I think that the daily attendance has been pretty typical. Um, we've had some students obviously dismissed for appointments and whatnot, but I don't think that we've seen any kind of um, unusual pattern so far with daily attendance. Great, thank you. All right. I just have one more thing in my superintendent's report, if there's nothing else. Um, I just wanna share, I realize I haven't shared this with you, but um, I just want to, um, oh, sorry about this. We, um, I just want to kind of give a, a thank you and a, and a shout out to Josh Cutler. Um, when the, the house, um, the state didn't finish their budget until uh, late uh, summer, I think it was maybe uh, end of June. Um, and uh, our state rep Josh Cutler called me one afternoon and um, said that he was filing some budget amendments and was there anything that uh, Duxbury needed? And I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, we just need money, you know? I mean, with knowing what was gonna, um, what we we're gonna be faced with, techno with technology. So with Josh's advocacy, um, he got a $75,000 budget amendment approved um, in the House and ultimately the Senate and um, for technology improvements. And so, you know, it, it's gonna go a long way we had to buy a significant amount of new iPads and, and uh, Chromebooks to, um, to to be able to open the year in a hybrid model. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just say this, Josh gets things done, uh, as does uh, Senator O'Connor and uh, Rep, Rep Lanatra. So we, we really appreciate it. He's always thinking about us um, during, you know, state budget time and other times, but just want you to know, we got a $75,000 amendment. Um, it's, um, we don't have the money in hand yet. Uh, it, it sort of operates like a, a, it's a reimbursement program. And so we'll track our expenditures and, and Katie will be working with, um, I don't know if it's Department of Ed um, or some other department at the, at the state level uh, to submit for reimbursement, but um, it's, that's not a small amount of money. And so I just wanted to, uh, we haven't talked about that um, since, the, um, since the budget was um, completed. So just wanted to make that final point. So thank you, um, Rep. Cutler, as well as our other legislators for advocating for uh, Duxbury students. Uh, and that, that is my, um, that's all I have to say for my report. Thank you. All right, thank you. 
and uh, kudos to Josh Cutler. I, I find him always helpful for the schools. He's always looking out for us. Um, Danielle. Yep. Okay. I'm just trying to get my screens in order here. So good evening. I just wanted to follow up on some of the information that Dr. Antonucci shared. Uh, one of the points he made was um, cohort C. So I just wanted to say that one of the particular areas of focus that we planned on um, having for our first few weeks of school would be was not only to look at how our hybrid model um, was working in action when our students were in front of us. And I know we shared some examples of the high school teachers and how they were engaging students at home and at school. But I have to say that from day one, our elementary teachers were also working so hard and doing such an incredible job to be engaging the students at home and at school simultaneously. And that is no easy feat when you're dealing with five through 10 year olds. And so um, it's not just the high school that's managing that, the elementary school has been incredible. But um, cohort C we knew was going to be um, something that we were going to have to um, develop as the fall went on. Our goal was to get the um, majority, largest majority of our students in and learning. Um, in cohort C, we had made some tentative plans for, and we were ready to roll, but um, this is definitely going to be a work in progress throughout this first month of school. I think what was challenging was um, the first few days of in-person school, any elementary year, whether it's um, in a pandemic or if it's just a typical year, um, the first few days of school are a slow progression through how things work at their new grade level. Teachers are developing their classroom culture. Um, this year, we were not only doing all that, but we were showing the students the new school procedures with our new restrictions that we have in place. Um, and also, we always teach students how they're going to access their curriculum and learning materials um, in this new school year. I think last week, this left some cohort C families wondering, um, I think people were probably sitting at home on September 14th with a sharpened pencil in hand, ready to do some real schoolwork with their young students. And they were saying, this isn't the robust um, academic day that I was expecting. And so that's where when we've asked for some flexibility, I think that came into, um, into play. And so last week, the um, principals and curriculum supervisors worked extremely hard um, to add to the resources available. So I'd like to um, direct you, if you have a chance in the next few days to take a look at the, um, I think I sent you an example of it last week, but we have added a section of elementary remote learning resources to both the Chandler and the Alden websites where families are able to access the learning grids for the week for all three cohorts. So whether your student is in cohort A, B, or C. Um, we've also shared a frequently asked questions document with our cohort C families last Friday, just with some questions that were starting to be a little bit of a pattern. Um, what do I do if my Zoom link's not working? What do I do if I can't act, I can't find something? And um, we've tried to make the learning grid such that if the technology isn't working, um, we have a backup plan. And so that we don't want any cohort C families at home having a link failure on Zoom and then sitting there saying, well, now that my computer's not working or Zoom's not working or my Google Classroom's not working, I have nothing to do with my child all day and I, I wanna do some work. So um, we're trying to make plan A, B and C for our families. Um, we wanted to just share that we have some next steps that we're thinking. Um, I think this week was a lot better um, for our cohort C students because we started getting into the academics, I think at the end of last week. And so we were able to really share some academic assignments with our cohort C students um, that are working at home with their families. We also have two cohort C teachers at each elementary school that we wanna be really clear. They're not replacing the classroom teacher instruction. They're supplementing and supporting what's happening with the planning at the classroom level. So all of our elementary um, learning grids are consistent from class to class. And the students that are in cohort C are working on those assignments at home with support from either their family member, um, whoever the um, families have decided are available to help their kids or if there's a scheduled time with a cohort C teacher to be able to do a whole group or a small group learning lesson. So those are underway. Um, some things that we thought of, um, Rita Marie Benoit came up with a great idea for um, us to have coffee with the curriculum supervisors. We'd like to do that twice a month for our cohort C families that are working at home so that they don't feel that they're on an island with just a learning grid and however they've set up their, their home classroom. So we wanna be able to um, troubleshoot have them ask questions about the curriculum and to be able to answer those questions live and also talk about what's working really well um, for the families. 
Uh, we also, I had a long talk with Mr. E from Alden School this afternoon. We know that um, it's not just about what's working for families with cohort C, it's also what's working for classroom teachers. And so the teachers have been back for almost two weeks now and our classroom teachers are managing not only the students in front of them, but also the students that are on live with them, but we also have that third group of cohort C students that are part of the class. And now that we're doing this, we're gonna to start to identify some questions that we may not have thought of in our plans or that we need to make a plan for. So we um, hope to be able to meet with our classroom teachers at the elementary level to see um, what's working well, what, what have you started to wonder about that maybe we didn't have time to wonder about in the summer when we were preparing start. Um, this week it came up with one family that um, found themselves with a situation where they were in need of quarantining for a number of reasons for their own family and they I think they kind of thought they'd be able to quickly switch to a remote learning environment seamlessly and it's not quite that simple and so we're going to be making a plan for any family that might find that they are in need to quarantine and it always starts with the school nurse we need to go through our protocols to determine um, if students should be quarantining um, we have families that are working with kathy carney from the town um, to determine what the safe choices are when kids can return to school and and in, in collaboration with the principals and the classroom teachers, we will make a plan for any student who has to work at home for a couple of days or two weeks or a month. We have one, we had a couple of students that needed to be home for a little bit longer. So we hope to be presenting just steps to follow if you are questioning if your student needs to work from home. So a quarantine plan that we hope to be able to link to the teacher's Google Classroom so that, teach, that students and families know what to do if they find themselves in that situation and they're already in cohort A or B. Um, and I think that we've, when we've talked a lot at school committee over the summer about just the need for everyone to be flexible. And what we're noticing is that everyone says, of course, we will be flexible. Flexible is my middle name. And then as soon as they're placed in a situation where they're being directly impacted and need to be flexible, that's when it doesn't feel so good. And so um, what we need to remember is that if there's a bump in the road, that it's not a crisis and we don't want anyone to be panicking because your Zoom link doesn't work or if you all of a sudden something's not working out, um, a bump isn't a crisis. But a bump is something that we need to make note about and we need to write it down and we need to come together and work through some of these things and rethink and adjust our plan and that comes from not just our families working through these bumps but teachers too i think teachers are starting to identify this isn't really working um this and so we need to be able to communicate touch base with our groups throughout the fall and, and make pivots and adjustments as needed. So that's something that we're committed to doing. Um, and I think it's gonna be a work in progress, but we just, again, need everyone's flexibility. Um, and just certainly, I don't want anyone to feel like they're complaining if something's not working. We would just ask that we had shared in our, in our fall learning plan, the progression of who to contact when something's not going right or if something unexpected comes up. And we always, it always goes back to start with the classroom teacher. Um, our curriculum supervisors this year are going to play a very important role. Um, when we have families that are kind of managing their children's learning from home because they've opted into the remote model, they really are their child's teacher. Um, and whether that's a grandparent or a parent or um, lucky, if you're lucky enough to have a babysitter that's able to work with some of the kids at home, um, there's so many people that are going to be playing a part in the students' education this year. So we all have to work together um, and expect there to be bumps. And the reason for that is we basically invented an entirely new learning model for Duxbury this fall. And we never would have thought that you would go back to school and everything would work perfectly. You have to kind of um, adjust as you go along. And we expect that there would be some issues that we couldn't predict. Um, and you can't spend your whole summer predicting problems ahead of time. We kind of had to see how it, how it's all rolling out. And um, I have to say, overall, it is running more smoothly than any of us ever expected. And that's due to, in large part, um, I, I know John already mentioned it. So we have some incredibly dedicated and creative teachers that are saying, bring it on. Um, we'll figure this out this year. And we have a lot of supportive families that um, are doing everything they can to make their, their students available and they're working with us really closely. So. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with cohort C families over the past week, and I think with a little bit more explanation, a lot of them felt a lot better once they had some of the why behind some of the things that were going on and just understanding that th things aren't always as simple as they seem 
from the outside. So we're, we're planning a lot of moving parts right now. And um, I think it's going, going well, but we definitely have some room, room for improvement and room for growth. So that's all for me on cohort C and the hybrid learning grid update. Great, thank you. Anybody have any comments or questions? Now, and again, you've put in a, an incredible amount of work and it's showing. And yeah. the teachers, we are very fortunate to have the staff that we do and the teachers who are so dedicated to our students. So thank you, Danielle. Kelly Shannon had her uh, hand up. Yeah, let me, just, let me just plug in. I'm on wireless and I just lost you guys for a minute. So let me just get my, um, sorry for the camera. There we go. I just want to get my internet plugged. Can you guys still hear me? Yep. We hear you, yeah. Okay. So I, I just, I wanted to say thank you for that, Danielle. I'm, as most people know, I am the parent of a cohort C child. And um, I think, I think that message just needs to continue to be delivered. Um, that um, there are going to be bumps and we're all understanding of it. Um, it. It, you know, for our family, at least the first two weeks have been extremely rough. Um, and I think this teachers and everybody has been absolutely wonderful, um, but it is very unsettling. And I think it's important to recognize that and to be understanding of the parents um, and, and to understand that, you know, the home situations are all different and everyone's balancing a lot of different balls. And, you know, one thing that stuck out in my mind when you're talking is the whole attendance requirement, right? And it's a 15 minute class. <laughs> And if you have three or four other kids running around and you can't get your six or seven year old on the class in time, and I know the message has been sent, just email and explain what happened. Um, but we just, I think just everybody being understanding, you know, it's, it's flexibility, but it's also compassion and, and understanding that we're all going through this completely new world together. Absolutely. So I, I just, I want to say thank you for the message that you just delivered. And I think we just need to continue to deliver that to the families. Thank you, Shannon. I think um, you just made me think. One of the other resources that is under development is just a um, tech. It's a tech troubleshooting guide for families that maybe don't want to reach out and do a tech email for the tenth time. And it's always the the first thing you always need to do is reboot. That's what they teach you in um, tech school. That just reboot your computer if that's not working. Here's here's ten other things you can try to get your uh, devices working from home because it is a panicky feeling when you are trying to get your child logged into something or it's a live lesson or maybe your child has a small group and there's only two kids in it and you don't want to miss that and I think it's an intense amount of pressure like you said you might have multiple kids at home and juggling a lot and so we are going to be sharing um, that tech troubleshooting guide and we also um, we've shared with parents we have an incredible resource that we shared with families last year and it is all of our elementary um, technology and curriculum resources. That document is going to be shared with families over the next couple of days. And we we aren't just sending that list home saying, here's, a, here, here's some websites, just go visit these websites. These are curated and these websites have been um, reviewed by our curriculum supervisors, our administrators and our classroom teachers to say that these are the best of the best. These align with what we're doing in Duxbury. These align with our curriculum and um, you can always feel free if you're finding yourself in cohort C at home to um, access any of those. And they're separated by content area, social emotional learning. Um, there's all kinds that are game, more game centered and there's um, just every topic you can imagine. So I really encourage our families to take advantage of those. We use a lot of our um, district funding that we have for curriculum to be able to purchase those subscriptions. And then we even use some of our CARES Act and COVID money um, to get even more of those programs because we knew how much families and teachers would, need, would be needing those supplemental resources this year. So we have like, we have in the most amazing library of um, resources that families can utilize. So we'll continue to send that, that list out, which is a great alternative if you find yourself not being able to access either the learning grid or something's not working for you that we, you have a backup plan at all times. Great. That's great. I think one improvement that I've seen, I just, and then I'll be quiet, is um, the centralizing of information. I will say that was one thing that I heard a lot from other parents that we experienced was the first four or five days, there were just so many emails. There, you know, and everyone was just trying to provide information, private information, you know, and it's an email world. So you have 300 emails in your inbox. And it's like, which one do I go to, you know? Um, and I think in the last week or so, the, the school has done a really good job of centralizing information. So just continue to try and focus on that and having kind of one-stop shopping, you know, for the parents who are trying to balance all their different kids and stuff. 
Right. And I hope that the clever, I hope the clever single sign on when I say that it was not easy for that clever to get set up this summer, it's an understatement, but we were really, and Sarah Milner was essential with getting that whole clever implementation in place to be able to have the students access all of those different learning websites from one single sign on. Um, and it, we were cutting it right till the day before the students began. So I hope that that also helps with the um, password issue because that was another real challenge for families last year is like not only figuring out, like you said, Shannon, all the different places I have to look, but now I forgot the password Word and I can't even get in. So I'm glad to hear that that's a little bit better. Yeah, um, I'd, um, I'd like to just comment and Shannon, I think um, your comment was sort of a perfect um, preface to my comment because this comment is a little general. I, I'm very concerned um, how quickly a small number of parents have turn to disparaging our, our, our school leaders and our faculty and are not mindful of the challenges that our schools are facing. And I, I don't know what it is about public education. I mean, to me, I think many of us are involved because we believe it's at the, not only the heart of our community, but heart of our society. And we want to do our best to support it. But I've never seen another profession that people are so quick to assume that they're expert. And people are so quick to judge a professional who's devoted a life's work to public education and to attribute the worst possible motives, um, uh, underlying um, objectives, lack of compassion, lack of care. I just like to say to our community, you need to shape up and understand that all of us are going to struggle, but you have no right to disparage. And the way you said it, Shannon, is I think such a great role model because you said this is incredibly challenging and the, the impact on your family is very profound, but you also appreciate and thank the challenges that the schools are facing. And I just think every single family that has challenges, which they all do, have to treat our administrators and our professional educators with both respect, but also deference because they are professionals. And unless you've walked in their shoes, some of the, some of the criticism is just so discouraging and it's coming from our friends and neighbors. So I just like to say, I loved what you said because it was very real, but it was also very respectful. And I just think it would be a great example for how people need to try and interface with our faculty and our administrators. Our schools are under-resourced. They have a multi multitude of challenges. Duxbury's just moved, moved from green to yellow, you know, um, and our families need to not be afraid to question or criticize, but to do so in a manner that I think respects the professionals that we've recruited and have, are employed in our school district. They have the best interest of every student at heart. So I just like to say, I love what you said, but I hope people will pay attention that are struggling as much as you and all the rest of us to not be so quick to judge and disparage our educators. I just think it's a really, it's really bad form and it seems like it's acceptable in this day and age to, um, to disparage and assume the worst. Um, and I just don't think that's okay. I don't think it, it it's just not acceptable. Um, so I, I'd like to say thank you and you don't deserve some of the criticism that you've received. You deserve some, <laughs> but none of, none of the disparaging and um, you know undermining of um, the intentions that everyone who is involved with the schools that are trying to do the best we possibly can for all of our families and all of our students. So. So anyhow, Shannon, I appreciated your remarks, and I, I just hope it's a role model for people to recognize that are uh, experiencing these challenges, just to, to, to try and, um, you know, whether it's a patience or flexibility or understanding, um, but certainly, um, you know, uh, be professional in your interaction with our professionals in the schools. Um, it's just not right. So anyhow, I'd like to just call that out. I'm really, I'm really disappointed. And I understand the emotions are high, stress is high in our society, but there's, there's no place for, 
for some of the stuff that's being directed at our educators. Thanks, Pete. I just want to say it. Kelly got logged off. Yeah, um, not so yeah, uh, hopefully Kelly will be back soon. But until then, I get to follow that up with returning back to the agenda, and I'm happy to do that. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Katie Blake, and she'll give us an update on business and finance. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so I have some good news to share tonight in regards to our meal service program. Through a federal grant from the USDA, Duck Spray Public School students will all be eligible to receive both free breakfast and free lunch until December 31st of this year or until the federal funding runs out. So one free breakfast and one free lunch is granted per student per day. And in addition to that, we will also be continuing our remote meal program, um, which will be similar to the program that we offered in the spring. Um, and our families will have the opportunity to pick up meals for their students on either Monday morning or on Wednesday afternoon at Duxbury Middle School. And more information on this program will be available in each one of the school's newsletters um, that are sent home to the families in addition to information that's posted on the food service tab on the district's website. Um, I also wanted to follow up tonight on uh, to our last meeting. So I've provided you with some supplemental information in regards to our CARES Act phase one, two, and three funding allocation in the school committee folder. So in that report, the document provides more details on the expenditures that we've incurred for each one of the categories that I reported on at the last meeting. So at the last meeting, if you remember, I just provided a high level percentage breakdown for facilities, some of our instructional materials and supplies that we purchased, instructional software, some furniture, technology purchases, PPE. So that document underneath each one of those high level um, categories has a breakdown of each one of the vendors and what the expense was for each for each vendor, as well as an expense description. So if you have any questions about any of the expenses, again, the, the initial funding that we received through the CARES Act was $674,000. So it was a pretty significant, um, pretty significant amount of funding that went into opening up the school. So if there's any questions um, on that supplemental document, I had just put it in the, the school committee folder today, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and so also with the CARES Act funding, the town of Duxbury was just recently issued a phase four award of CARES Act funding in the amount of 698 thousand nine hundred dollars. So the school department, as well as the other town departments, um, were asked to provide a list of needs to the town sense director by last Friday, which we um, submitted a pretty significant list of expenses that we anticipate that we will be incurring by December 30th of this year. Um, and we're still awaiting confirmation on what the overall allocation for the school department will be. Um, and I hope to provide some additional details um, about those funds at our next meeting in October. That's it. Great. Great, thank you. Thanks, Katie. Okay. I'm back. Hey, we were talking about technology. My computer completely crashed <laughs> and my 17 year old said, let's restart it. There you go. So that's what happened. Danielle, you should be a tech director. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, all right, great. Thanks, Katie. So student rep, we don't have right now, right? No, we're going to have one, though. OK, good. Um, I really don't have anything, I don't think. Um, I kind of say as I'm going along. So discussion items is the Title I update, Danielle. I'm going to share my screen. All 
Are you seeing my Title I and federal grant update? Nope. Or are you seeing my screen? I didn't think so. All right, let's try that again. It's not letting me switch. I can, John, would you be able to do yeah. the, um, share? It's not letting me click on the other screen I have set up. Do you want me just to, uh, let me just, I gotta grab the presentation. Yeah, sorry about that. It's in the school committee folder. Yep. Just give me one sec, please. So while John does that, um, the reason I'm going through the Title I and federal grant update tonight is because part of the regulations for school districts that receive federal funding under Title I is that we do um, parent information sessions on a yearly basis about our Title I program. This open house, we were really kind of um, trying to consolidate so much information for families that um, I was hoping to be able to share this message at school committee with all of you as well as to our families. And I hope to also visit some PTA meetings this year so I can share our, our Title I information for the school year. I'm, so I'm having trouble. I, am I, I, I think while I can, you guys are doing that, ones, yeah. um, you guys could just John and Daniel keep doing it just just to amplify what Peter said as an example, you see how Danielle cannot share a screen right now. John's trying to figure out how to share the screen. Just multiply that by 10,000. And that's sort of what happens every day in, in a school district trying to teach in a remote and a hybrid environment. So I actually am glad that this is happening right now because as for a bunch of adults who are on a meeting, we can be patient, but <laughs> trying to do classroom management with a bunch of kids who are trying to look at things is, is kind of a different story. So I'm actually glad this is happening. Yeah, I'm not glad, Matt. That makes fun of you. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot, for some reason, my, I don't know if my wife, my Wi-Fi has to be working, but I can't get into Google Drive right now. Well, hang on. I, I think I can. So give me one second here. Yeah, I, I have it open on screen share and I'm clicking on my presentation and it won't let me switch. I think Drive might be down. You think so? All right, it is for me. I can certainly um, it's open. Hang on one sec. This is the federal grant update. Yeah. All right. Hang Slide deck. Let me just. Uh... Yeah, I can't get it to any of my uh, Google Drive folders. There it is. Hey, thanks, Matt. Sure. To the rescue. Okay, great. So we have um, three title grants that we qualify for in Duxbury. Title I Part A um, is the one that I'll be mainly speaking about tonight, and that provides financial assistance to school districts and schools based on census poverty estimates and the cost of education in each state. And so I know right now is census time, and um, it's really important that as many people as possible in our Commonwealth complete the census data because we rely on accurate census data in order to be able to get very important funding to our school districts. Title IIA is another federal grant um, that provides supplemental resources that allow us to support and enhance um, excellent teaching and learning. We, um, again, they are, this funding is based on assisting low-income and minority students to gain access to effective teachers, principals, and school leaders. And we are able to use the funding under Title A in a Title IIA in a number of ways. Title III is a, um, a grant that we don't qualify for. That provides um, resources to districts that have um, minimum numbers of, numbers of English learner students. And while our English learner population has increased significantly um, through the past few years, I think we generally have about um, 10 to 20 English learners in our school district. And we also monitor students that are former English learners that are called FLEPs, former, former, former students that are receiving services. Um, we don't qualify to receive funding in that area. So that's one grant that, that I don't manage. And Title IV provides support to districts in order to build capacity um, to ensure that students have equitable access to um, high quality educational experiences and Title IV really aims to support social and emotional learning initiatives, anti-bullying, um, and that sort of thing. In July, each year, we find out what our federal grant allocation is, and we're always teetering on the edge of that 5% threshold with our um, census poverty data to um, be able to qualify for support. And so I'm always on the edge of my seat at the beginning of July, hoping that our funding doesn't go down because it's not a lot of funding in terms of what our entire school budget is, but we spend every last penny on of the, this funding on such important resources for the school district. 
This year, our Title I allotment was 65,462. It was down about 10,000 from last year and about additional 10,000 from the year before. So we are seeing a decline in our district Title I funding. Title IIA, 32,817. And we got a straight up 10,000 in Title IV this year. So you can advance to the next slide. So our Title I funds, um, we're a tar uh, targeted assistance school district. And what that means is that we have less than 40% of our students are receiving free or reduced lunch. If you are in a school district that has 40% or greater students qualifying for free and reduced lunch, you are able to have a school-wide program that has different um, restrictions and regulations. But targeted assistance means that our, our Title I funding needs to be spent on supplemental resources to provide intervention and support to our students greatest at risk of not making effective progress in their grade level. Um, this year we have Chandler, Alden, and Duxbury Middle School as our designated Title I schools. If you have a school district with, say, five elementary schools, the way you'd prioritize your Title I funding might be that you look at the school that has the greatest percentage of free and reduced lunch students in that school, and you'd, be, you'd have to have that be your Title I school. But because we're single, um, single schools that service the designated grade levels, we um, were able to spread our funding to the three schools um, this year. Um, what, what do we do with um, our funding? We prioritize intervention resources. So our Title I funding pays for our math tutors. Um, we have two math tutors at Chandler School and two at Alden. And if I can just circle back to that question about who covers for our teachers when we can't find subs, we count on our math tutors as well as our building principals and other, other teachers that may be able to have a little bit more flexibility with their schedule. So I should have mentioned that the math tutors have been really stepping up and helping out with um, classroom coverage. We, um, our math tutors see students in small groups as well as in classroom setting. We um, use Lexia Reading Program, which is a, a phonics-based, multi-sensory, highly structured reading program that supports student um, achievement in reading. In IXL Math, we also use as a supplemental resource. Our Title I, Title I fund funding is also used to purchase assessments. Um, this year and last year, we will be doing iReady Math at Chandler, which is a new assessment that we really like. And Ames Web Benchmark Assessment System. I'm sure families are familiar with Ames Web. And at Alden School, we do star reading in math, um, as well as um, district common assessments and MCAS testing. But all of this gives us good information about um, where students are functioning. Title IIA and Title IV, how do we spend those funds? Um, our Title IIA funds help support mentors for our new teachers and other staff members. In the summer, um, we spend a lot of time with our new teacher induction program. And we have a really, what I think is a robust um, new teacher induction program. We have our new teachers um, for three days in the summer, um, acclimating themselves to the district and the programs and our beliefs. And um, our mentors are trained and they spend one day in the summer with our new teachers at the new teacher induction. And the mentors work with our new teachers all the time, but formally twice per month throughout the school year. So our mentors and mentees um, attend monthly um, facilitated mentor meetings. And then they also have um, usually weekly meetings with, where they keep a log of the time spent with the, um, the new staff. Title IIA also pays for high quality professional development and that High quality term there is what there's a lot of guidelines that we have to follow in terms of what is allowable and what is considered to be high quality professional development. Um, this year we're using um, some of the funds to fund some of our new teacher induction resources. All of our new teachers receive a couple of um, mentor texts that we feel are strong and we use those as our, our guide as we work through the schedule in the um, different topics of our new teacher induction. We also have a second year um, program for our second year teachers that Cheryl Lewis, our technology director and I teach a three credit graduate course to our second year teachers. And that starts um, the week school gets out. Um, they had to jump right into a second year teacher course last year. So they didn't get to have any of that. Oh, last day of school, I'm finally free. They jumped right into a full week all day long course with Cheryl and I that continues into the school year. Um, in fact, tomorrow we have our first session um, we meet with them twice per month from September till de until December. 
And um, we, whenever possible, we use Title I funding to have teachers attend regional and national conferences. And a lot of times national conferences will rotate um, being held in Boston. And we love to be able to send our teachers to national conferences when they're in Boston. This year, our Title IV, if you recall, it was $10,000. We flexed that money into our Title I program. And I flexed a little bit of the Title IIA funding into our Title I program so that we would be able to have more funding to resource um, direct intervention and resources for um, our students. So that's how I made up the difference when we received a little bit less Title I funding. I took some out of Title II and Title IV. You can flex money into Title I, but I could never take money out of Title I to move it into Title IIA or Title IV. That's the way the funding regulations work. Um, how are students identified for Title I support? So we're always trying to support and supplement regular classroom instruction. So as I do some of this stuff to determine which students would be prioritized for Title I. And so what we have to do is administer all of those assessments. We also take teacher feedback into consideration. If a student has taken MCAS test, that will also be in, taken into consideration. And when all of that data is available to us, we need to rank order our students to make sure that the students that are most in need of support are the ones that are getting that intervention. Some of the intervention might be that the classroom teacher is able to have the student work on Lexia. Um, and some of it may be that the student um, would be needing to be pulled out for some services um, to work with the Title I math tutors or with um, a reading specialist. Anytime we identify Title I students, and this has been a little bit different since I started working for the district, um, we need to send home um, a permission form if your child is to be getting a um, supplemental intervention and a family pact at the elementary level. And um, that had, hadn't occurred previously when um, before I came in the district, but as I've said before at this meeting, we do get audited um, and we had a full audit last year, a tiered focus monitoring to make sure that we're following all of the um, guidelines for these federal funds. So they do make sure that we're doing all the, the pieces that we need to be doing. Some parents were a little bit taken aback to receive a Title I um, identification letter, to be honest, and they were saying, oh, I've never gotten one of these before. Um, so it felt a little bit weird. And so that's why we try as much as we can to go to all of those different meetings when possible to make sure parents aren't surprised. It's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean that um, anything changes in the student's life except that they have um, availability of some extra additional support. And, they, and if they don't need it anymore, they're able to move right out of um, receiving that service. I mentioned that um, services may occur in class in small group setting or during intervention block. So we're very grateful at DMS this year, we've added that intervention support and now the students have a block to do it. Um, and so now that students are, um, if students are identified at student support team as needing additional support in reading, um, they may be um, working with, um, I think they, they purchased a Renaissance reading support program at the middle school and then IXL might be a math, um, resource program that they would be working with during their intervention block. And as I said, Title I support is fluid. Um, if our fall benchmark testing indicates that some students qualify for some support and they take their winter benchmark testing and no longer are in need of support in that area, they would no longer um, be required to get that service and we would notify parents that their, their students are working um, closer to grade level at that point. So here's a couple of questions that we receive quite frequently. Um, does my child need to be on free and reduced lunch to receive Title I services? And the funding we receive is based on estimates of census poverty data, but absolutely not. Title I has nothing to do with a family receiving, tight, um, receiving free and reduced lunch. I did receive um, a letter from a family last year that was quite upset that their child was being targeted at, as at risk because they don't qualify for free and reduced lunch. And I, we have to just always say it has nothing to do with any, we don't have free and reduced lunch on our um, student information so that that's visible to anyone. So we don't even look to see who our free and reduced lunch students are unless Katie's working with that data from the business office with the food service director um, in terms of other state um, funding opportunities. So it's certainly not suggesting that anyone is a free and reduced lunch um, eligible student if you do ever receive a Title I letter. 
Um, will they remain in the program all year? No, you may um, get a letter in the fall saying your child qualifies for some math support. If they, as I said, if they um, test out of that, they certainly would move right out. And again, if your child tests into the program mid-year or towards the spring, um, you might get a letter at a different point in the school year saying, we'd like to have your child receive some intervention support. So we're always moving students in and out of Title I and our curriculum supervisors work really closely with our reading specialists and with our math tutors to determine that um, the, the, the students that are most in need are always the one receiving the intervention. Um, do I need to give permission for my child to receive Title I? Yes, you get a brief letter and a family compact and you just send that back in saying that, um, yes, I'm aware that my child will be um, receiving intervention. You should know from the letter what type of intervention it is. Um, we have had a families that have opted out of it, but very few. I think maybe out of the many, many letters we send home, maybe two families might say, I, I'd prefer that my child not leave the general classroom to get the extra math tutor support, or um, I will supplement their reading with additional practice at home. I'd prefer that they don't get intervention at school. Um, and again, whenever we do an intervention, it's never done in a way that singles any student out. We have um, so many service providers that are giving students support throughout the day that it's just part of the school day. And it's never um, a situation where a student is um, kind of put in the spotlight if they're if they're receiving any extra support. The students wouldn't even notice. It would just seem like part of their typical school day because we have so many small groups and students going here, there, and everywhere with um, different centers in the classroom, um, in and out of the classroom. And so that's that's the Title I program in a nutshell. If anyone has any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Anyone? No, thank you for that. That was very useful. Thank you. Very thorough. Is that the same thing as RTI? What it used to be RTI, sort of? Yep. And so in, under RTI, there's different um, tiers of support. And so when you might have had um, RTI in the past, it might have been that that second level of tier two support might have been provided by the um, math tutor or it might have been by a reading specialist to be able to do some of the Lexia work or small group work but um, it probably just wasn't called Title I um, and I don't believe that we even call it Title I in the schools. I call it Title I because I have to justify all the spending and the funding um, but at the same time it, it just looks like an intervention um, for extra support in the in the schools themselves so. A great program. Correct. Thanks Danielle. Yep, you're welcome. Um, our next discussion items are the policy revisions. Um, John, do you want to put those up, or it's kind of lengthy? I wasn't Maybe. going. I wasn't. I wasn't going to. Um, okay. I did Just, want to make the. Well, I mean, I can if you want. Well, has everybody read them? Does. Yeah. Does yeah. Anybody need to see yeah. them? I just I want to point. Agree. I just want to point out a couple of things. Sure. Um, so, and I'll say this, this is our, our policy review uh, requires uh, a first reading and then an approval. So tonight's officially the first reading and you know that just for the public's sake, it'll be posted on the website, um, you know, by tomorrow. And if, the, you know, if there's any community input that people wish to give that, you know, they can do that and then we'll vote, we'll vote at the next meeting. Um, the first policy is um, um, our harassment policy. Uh, it's policy ACAB, and there's also a corresponding um, policy ACAB-R, which are regulations and procedures that correspond to the, to the policy. Um, just by way of background, so this is, um, there's a federal law um, or regulation, I guess, Title IX. Um, and Title IX prohibits discrimination uh, on the basis of sex, um, in education programs or activities receiving financial assistance from the government. And obviously that includes um, K to 12 schools. Um, and there was some significant changes at the federal level this summer, or at least they were voted, I think finally this summer in Title IX. And it modified some um, standards uh, and, and sort of our obligations under Title IX uh, as a school district, you know, in several areas. And so, um, uh, MASC, which is the Mass Association of School Committees, on the heels of those, that decision, 
crafted a model policy for districts. And just for, for people's edification who might be interested or listening, most of our policies um, are MASC policies. Uh, and if you look at Duxbury's policies, compared to other districts in the state, they, they, are kind, they kind of all look the same uh, with some, some slight modification of customization, but for the most part, um, district policies are kind of driven by this, this body, you know, Mass Association of School Committees. So the, uh, I, some key changes for K-12 schools, um, very generally, it's sort of like, you know, when and how schools must respond to and investigate allegations um, of misconduct under Title IX and the policy kind of lists all that out. Uh, there's some changes to due process and procedural requirements. It's interesting, there is some, um, this is sort of editorial. Um, the, the, the changes really actually were criticized by some people for strengthening protections um, of the alleged perpetrators and kind of weakening protections um, of the sexual assault victims. And so I don't really have a comment on that, but that's been, that's been kind of a, a theme. And I say that because I, I um, one of the key changes uh, and decisions that we have to make is about um, evidentiary standards. And I'm not a lawyer, by the way, and, but and I nor do I want to pretend to be one. But there's um, schools may elect uh, either one, uh, one of two permissible evidentiary standards um, to apply. Right. So as we're making a determination if there was misconduct. It's either uh, what they call clear and convincing evidence. And that means uh, basically that there's a high probability or a reasonable certainty that alleged conduct has occurred. And there's a second standard though, um, which is preponder preponderance of evidence, um, which means that it's more likely than not that the alleged conduct occurred. So it's, it's less stringent. Um, and I, I wrote this to you guys on a memo, but I, I, after consulting with our attorneys, um, and I think just kind of the general consensus around the state is that we should select, and I'm recommending we so select the preponderance of evidence standard. Um, I just think that um, it's the recommendation of counsel, and it's also, and you know, Shannon, you're a lawyer, you can attest to this, but um, I'm, I'm told that it's the standard typically used in, in other uh, in sexual harassment. And, 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 uh, and other civil cases. So it kind of makes sense that we would use it um, sort of in kind of our investigatory procedures as well. Um, and other than that, you know, it just, it, it require, our districts are required, they've always been required to have um, a Title IX coordinator um, and, that's, and that's going to be Danielle. So uh, in the policy lays out kind of what the roles and responsibilities of the coordinator is and, um, Anyway, so I can answer I can answer some questions, um, but it's also one more thing I should have said is that it, the the policy it's pretty clearly laid out that you know the, the notice requirements and the dissemination of the policy requirements are significant. So we are obligated uh, we want to anyway, but we're obligated to really disseminate the policy and make sure everybody knows how to access um, uh, what, what's the right word I'm looking for. Um, not only access the policy, but how to file, you know, how to file a complaint uh, should someone, someone feel that they've been harassed. So we will, we will spread that like wildfire and make sure that both, you know, that, that students and staff alike um, have that um, handy. So that is it. Could you just clarify for me, um, one of the due process protections is um, something called a prohibition of a single investigator model. Um, so how does, how would that work in, or how does that work? Um, it's, it means not only the Title IX coordinator, but there are other school staff involved yes. in investigating? So typically we would have, um, it might be an assistant principal that would be conducting an interview or depending on the situation, it might be um, principals off also, um, it could be the athletic director. It could be that people are working together for different parts of the inter uh, interviewing of witnesses and um, that sort of thing. But you can't have the same person conducting the interview and being the, um, the one that's making the decision about it. There needs to be more of a team approach so that it's um, impartial, so that there's no chance that there's a biased um, 
process. And so you just want to cover your bases um, to make sure that there's all neutral people involved and you're pretty selective about who's doing the investigating. There's really three separate roles, just to add to what Danielle said. It's, it's the Title IX coordinator, um, the investigator, um, and that it depends who that, you know, might be depending on the circumstance, and then the decision maker. And to Danielle's point, they all need to kind of fulfill their roles um, so that, you know, there's no crossover really. Okay, understood, so, thank, thank you. Um, you know, John and Danielle, you know, my, my question is, um, you know, a lot of the discussion around this subject pertains to private institutions in higher ed. Um, and if there's conduct which is potentially criminal in nature, there's gonna be police involvement that has absolutely nothing to do with the schools. But what are the consequences if someone were to be found under the Title IX process in a public school, K through 12, what are the consequences? Because it's unlike a private institution that could expel a student mm -hmm. and it's not a criminal matter. So can, can we just clarify, and I don't know if this is a question that you know the answer to, but just to make sure people understand this, the school has a very limited role if there is serious misconduct, which could potentially involve the police and what we can do in terms of discipline is also limited by state law, I believe, in terms of expulsion or suspension or what have you. Yeah, well, so I don't have a great answer, a super clear answer, but I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a range, right, or a spectrum, I guess, of um, kind of severity of, of cases. And so the dis for us, if it's just school discipline, um, I guess I would say it depends on, on, what, on what the harassment was, right? And obviously we don't need to spell it out, but that, that, is a, that could be a wide range, a wide range of things. And, um, you know, we'd have to kind of apply our current discipline policies to see what, um, what is most, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not relevant, but um, can't think of the word I'm looking for. Applicable. Applicable, yeah, thank you. Um, my brain's getting fried, I think. Um, but, but Peter, the, to your point, there will be some, uh, some, some that rise to the kind of cr cr criminal standards, right? Not, not all, but, and in that case, you know, we'll probably pass that on pretty, you know, pretty quickly to, uh, you know, to law enforcement, um, and then kind of have to apply our disciplinary procedures. Um, okay. Okay, that's good enough. The, out, the outcome and that, you know, typically it's about how it's adjudicated and, you know, I mean, um, there's a whole host of student disciplinary laws that, that we apply every day. But so anyway, not to give you a wish you watch the answer, but it's sort of, it depends. Okay. I think we also um, at times need to um, include DCF depending on the type of situation we're investigating. So sometimes you're working with not only the school personnel, but also law enforcement, our SRO, as well as DCF. And so, okay. All right. So, should we move on to the face covering? Sure. Yeah, very, very exciting topic of um, face coverings. But so, this is about this is a, a, a COVID, you know, kind of COVID specific, um, or at least for now, I guess it's indefinite. Um, but MASC recommends that school committees adopt a face coverings policy. We've effectively laid out our policy. Um, well, even though it's unofficial, but we've effectively laid out an unofficial policy in our, in our back to school planning document. And we've communicated that, I think, pretty clearly to the community. The community. And so this policy, um, not surprisingly, you know, aligns quite nicely with that. And it just kind of lays out the requirements, um, you know, most notably that face coverings um, that cover the nose and mouth uh, must be worn by all individuals in school buildings and on school grounds um, at all times, you know, even when social distancing is observed. And it goes on to say, and we've communicated this as well, that uh, gaiters or, or buffs uh, right now are not acceptable, nor are uh, masks that have, have a valve. You know, we've seen those. Um, and then it talks about what the um, exclusions are. Uh, and they really align with CDC guidance. Um, you know, for example, if the individual is trouble breathing or is in, unconscious or incapacitated um, or can't remove the mask without assistance, the, that aligns with the CDC guidance. And so that's listed in our policy. And then it talks about when, um, 
when they will not be required. And uh, again, we've laid that out in our back to school plans, but it's, you know, during, it's very limited, you know, during mass breaks, um, when people are you know, eating or drinking. And then there's a very specific one per regulation from the state about um, during physical education classes, um, when outside and when you can achieve 10 foot, 10 feet of social distancing. So that's the only time that kids could take off their mask um, the day, you know, during a school day, um, in addition to the mass breaks and eat, eating or drinking. So anyway, so that's it. Pretty, pretty basic policy. I, I don't know, you know, I've really never had a, I, I've been thinking about this. I don't know if at some point the pol will vote the policy out or, or, you know, make it dependent on another pandemic or something, but this is a very COVID specific um, policy. Okay. And I, I would reiterate what I said in my opening remarks, masks are a non-issue right now in the Duxbury Public Schools, zero. Uh, and I'm not saying it's easy because it's exhausting you know, to wear a mask you know, for, for the day, but um, we've had zero. zero right. we What's that, Kelly? All right, good. I just said it's amazing what, what you can get used to. Yeah. Right, if you have to adjust, we do. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have questions about the masks? Nope. All right. So FY22 budget process. Here we go. Yeah. So this is actually going to be a very short um, conversation. Uh, we don't really have much to share other than you know, bad news. And, uh, and it's, um, there's actually an article in today's, I think today, um, today's Clipper reported out about a selectman's meeting and, I mean, the, 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 the kind of sad punchline is that departments, including the school department, are being asked to submit a, a 0% um, budget increase, um, $0, 0 zero percent budget increase. And, you know, for, for all you and those who are educated about the budget process, what that means is, is a significant, significant cut to services in our school department. Um, our level of services budget you know, so the amount of money we need next year to provide the same level of service that we're providing today, level of service, um, you know, will be somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars plus. Um, a lot of that comes from um, salary increases um, in our collective bargaining agreements, cost of living increases, step increases, um, and um, as well as other sort of statutory and you know mandated um, mandates that require us to you know to increase our budget on an annual basis, so it's a, it's a big hit. Uh, it's a huge hit. Um, I I I think based on our conversations and based on even what I'm reading is that you know that's a worst case scenario and there's there's good conversation happening about um, let's see what it looks like and then they make, make a decision as to um, next steps and whether or not we use stabilization funds again or or make, make other kind of changes or accommodations department by department, you know, time's gonna tell. Uh, we are back at the drawing board um, with a, a significant, significant cut to level of service. And just wanna remind you, you know, I mean, that's on the heels, you know, thank, thank goodness, the ultimate uh, budget that got voted at town meeting in August, um, you know, wasn't as uh, draconian as we originally anticipated, but, we're working on a, I think a one and a half percent increase from FY20 to 21. So we've already made several hundred thousand dollars of cuts just to open school this year. So to, to hit another to hit another million uh, is going to be really troubling. So I, I you know, I, I don't really have much to add. I mean, it's sort of a um, it's kind of a fasten your seatbelts moment, and um, you know, we'll be as transparent and, and honest as we can. Um, but we. We're gonna have some tough conversations. What makes it re even tougher, you know, we have a very early town meeting. D Duxbury's town meeting is the earliest in the Commonwealth. Uh, you know, quite quite literally, it's the earliest of, of all 351 municipalities. So it means that our budget process begins now. Uh, we'll be presenting our operating budget to school committee, I believe, on November 4th. Um, you know, and, and as we're talking about staff reductions or program, you know, program reductions or whatever it may be, you know, that's that's really tough. Uh, on, on a school culture and you know, tough on tough on people, tough on programs. Um, and so I, I, it's, it's frustrating. 
Um, but it's what we have in front of us and, and we'll do our best. Um, but I just kind of wanted to give you the heads up and give the community a heads up that it's not going to be pretty. Uh, it really isn't. And um, it's, very, it's distressing, actually, um, because we were actually a year ago in pretty good shape. As, as tough as tough it, is it always is to navigate a municipal budget process, um, I kind of liked our budget last year, despite the fact that it was pretty lean. We had started making some inroads on our strategic plan, um, you know, and then we had a pandemic. And so, you know, we had talked about potentially doing an operational override this year. I think there was very reasonable, rational conversation about that. That's sort of our, I think, just out, out of out of the equation right now, given what's happening in you know with the economy and in the community. But uh, it's really frustrating. Uh, we've we've taken a 180 degree turn, um, and here we are. So anyway, that's where we are. So it's not so much an agenda item as a uh, just a message, I guess. Any comments? So the next step in the process is you're going to draft, you're going to begin to draft the fiscal 22 budget. Yeah, yeah. Okay. you know, I, and I, I, I want to, I, I just, I want to say this out loud. Um, you know, I'm not trying to lower expectations, but um, we're going to try to make it as kind of a, an efficient um, process as possible this year, given what the exercise is. Right, so um, we, our budget last year, I mean, I, I thought it was exceptional. Um, we dug deep, deep, deep for, you know, reallocations um, to try to try to meet some of our um, uh, kind of needs of our strategic plan and what have you. And, you know, the, the, the well is not dry per se, right? We'll continue to go to the drawing board. Um, but because then we had to go back at it again uh, in the summer to do another round of round of reduction. So uh, I just I just want to say it's I, I'm trying to build a very very clear and transparent um, yet very efficient budget process because I, I think writing volumes and volumes of um, kind of information about what we need at this point it's not the right time to have that conversation. We've done that three years in a row um, and. I don't, want to, I don't want to sound whiny when I say this, but it hasn't yielded much. And so that we still have that. We know where we want to go as a district. We know it's important to kind of move this district forward. Uh, but this exercise isn't that. This ex exercise is more kind of a survival. Um, so anyway, it's disappointing, but we'll, uh, we'll get through it. And, uh, you know, Katie and our, uh, our administrators have a great handle on things. And, um, you know, we'll go from there, but it's tough. Yeah, it sounds like we'll just be able to cover our contractual obligations. Well, not we, even. We won't even. We won't be. Well, that's. We won't, we won't be able to meet them, without cutting. Okay. We have to meet them. Um, yeah. Sorry, so I don't mean to confuse them. We have to meet them, um, but that that because we have to meet them, you know, we have to find find out how to pay for it from from other existing programs or personnel. So, so yeah, I am, um, you know, this, it, it just, um, and I won't go on my soapbox, um, but quite, quite candidly, and I've never said this out loud, but if I knew what I knew now about Duxbury, I wouldn't have moved here with my family 20 years ago. This is a community that aspires to be a leader, and it aspires to be a great community, and we've consistently under-resourced our public schools. Um, there's a lot of aspiration and nostalgia over the quality of our education and, and by no means, and people that know me and know my history, I, I am like teacher supporter number one because I think that job is really where the rubber hits the road and the job that our faculty and our administrators do to provide the best they possibly can to our students. But for a community that has the resources that we do to accept a level of funding, it's been told to me that money doesn't grow on trees in Duxbury. Well, if you drive around town over the course of the last 10 years and you look at the prosperity in our community and in our commonwealth, 
and we're funding our schools in the bottom 20% of the state, it just is hard to defend. So look, if people want to accept this and just accept that the level of resources are um, sufficient, the schools should stop whining. I think there's a lot of backlash over the public schools a new building in the, in, that was built. But again, if you drive by North Plymouth, South Plymouth, Marshfield, there was a state incentivized renewal plan for our schools across the Commonwealth. Duxbury by no means is unique in having um, built a new integrated middle school and high school that integrated technology and position with infrastructure for the future. But if you don't support the operating budget of public education, the outcome is going to be not surprising in terms of the impact of the opportunities are on our students. I, I just can't say how distressing it is um, and how I think, uh, frankly, um, easy it is to say, well, the schools were great when my kids went through. The schools were great, you know, 15 years ago when my kids were able to get into a great college. Failing can be recognized the competitive nature of the world, the competitive nature of the Commonwealth, the dynamic and the required, the dynas, you know, the, the dynamic nature of education, the demands on our educators. So I, I don't know what more to say. At least the community is going to either have to step up or just uh, live with the consequences. And where we're headed is not good. Uh, and that's, you know, I, 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 I can't hold our leadership in any higher regard. So that's not a, a question about uh, the, the, um, the benefit we have of, uh, of leadership and the dedication of our faculty. But if the community isn't willing to step up to do something about our public schools on a long-term basis, I'm, I'm, I'm just really sorry to say, I find that really um, just hard to accept. It's not the community that I would have thought. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. And I hope that's like not moralistic. I just, I can't square with the affluence in this community. And again, I recognize there's diversity in our community as well. Not every, every you know, Duxbury is more diverse than first meets the eye, but that does not, square with the, the, the actual rubber hits the road commitment to support our public schools. And I hate to sound preachy or be on a high horse, but it's just, you know, it's, it, are parents gonna step up and, and, and get engaged in this or not? Um, Cause uh, you know, we're headed in a not good direction. Well, and I don't think you're preachy at all. I think what we have faced over the years, I mean, we're up, what, six years, seven years, Peter, with, you know, complaints about MCAS scores or whatever it is that, you know, might drive some folks to get involved because they're upset as a reaction. You know, this is sort of our reality and, and we've been warning folks about this for a long time. So I completely appreciate your comments. Well, and class side, I mean, you know, there, you can go down the laundry list and yep. people see the beautiful new school buildings and think that somehow Duxbury has got a, a gold plated um, capital infrastructure. Uh, but, you know, you just need to drive around the Commonwealth to recognize there was building renewal all across the state that was largely incentivized by the state. Um, and, and, and there seems to be a, a large um, a portion of our community that relishes in um, in in um, not making investments to improve the opportunities for our students. Our our leaders, our superintendent John, before you, you know, it's been ten years of our superintendent saying to provide a high quality commensurate to the expectations of our community education in a public school in Massachusetts, the cost of inflation is between three and 4% annually. And yet our community has cons consistently said we can do it at two and a half or two and a quarter. So, you know, you community, keep it up because, you know, you're not going to get what you want at the end of the day if you think you're going to under-resource the schools on a sustained basis. So anyhow, enough is enough. Um, said my piece. <laughs>
Well, I appreciate your remarks, Peter. And you have been an amazing advocate for the schools and doctors. Well, not, not so effective, I guess. Well, <laughs> it, it shouldn't I mean. stop you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, the announcement of the COPS Grant Award. Yeah, let me just um, try to share my screen here, see if we can. So, we got some great news um, last week uh, in that we were awarded um, by the federal government a $345,000 um, safety grant. Um, this, uh, as a note to here, was a joint application that we made um, with the Duxbury Police Department. Um, so we, we have a great partnership with the police department. Um, on our side, it was sort of an all hands on deck uh, approach. Um, I think special recognition does go to Cheryl Lewis, though, our director of technology, um, who kind of spearheaded, um, spearheaded the grant um, process and, and application. And so I just want to, I kind of want to thank her and give her recognition for that. So this is a, a COPS grant, Community Oriented Policing Services um, COPS. Uh, from the Department of Justice. Um, we sought funding. Um, we, when we found out that this grant was you know, potentially available, we looked at our infrastructure needs or our just needs in general. And we ended up settling on um, radios, uh, radio communication. And we don't currently have a re reliable way in our schools to communicate directly by radio with police and fire. I don't have to tell you all how, how difficult it is to use cell phones in Duxbury. Uh, they're very unreliable. And, um, you know, analog radios, kind of old fashioned walkie talkies just don't work well in the buildings and they, they have limited range and we can't do much with them other than kind of communicate internally. This funding um, is going to allow us to purchase a very sophisticated um, digital mobile radio system that will be used uh, uh, jointly by the schools, the police department and the fire department. And it's also going to give us a reliable communication system to use, uh, you know, just among our schools, right, within with our own, own campuses. And the radio is going to give us a direct line, very importantly, um, to the regional dispatch center, which is it's actually located in Duxbury. Uh, they call it the Rock Regional um, Dispatch Center. So for us to be able to press a button uh, and be able to communicate with dispatch and with police and with fire is just some a capability we don't capability we don't have today. Um, so it's just it, 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 I'm going to go to the final bullet here, but this is absolutely going to enhance the safety and security for our schools. Um, this is really a game changing um, grant for us in uh, in the kind of realm of communication, um, you know, for for kind of crisis events, and so we're, we're thrilled about it. There's only two other districts in the Commonwealth to get grants this year and that's Brockton and Randolph. Um, we're really we're really proud that we got it. Um, you know we think it's just a, a huge benefit to the to the schools and and our town's uh, public safety departments. Um, the system of buying I point out here is highly scalable. So if we ever need to add on to it or, or improve upon it in the future we can. Um, and I also very importantly probably should have said this up front instead of down the bottom but <clears throat> it's a 75 25 grant. So the town of Duxbury does have to contribute 25% and the federal government is going to contribute uh, the balance of 75% and that comes out to roughly 300, uh, just short, short of uh, $350,000. Town meeting in August already funded this, this project. So we have the money already from the town to meet our obligation um, to the federal government. So, um, and just in terms of what we're buying this is just a list of kind of what we're getting. It's you know portable radios and base stations and all kinds of um, stuff you know related to this, this digital um, this digital communication system. Um, so we're we're thrilled. Like I said, you know, multiple town departments benefit, um, and we're safer uh, and better for it. And so you know, thanks again to Cheryl for coordinating, and thanks again to the you know uh, police department who partnered with us uh, and everybody who else, uh, everybody else who contributed um, to the document, but it's a big win. And uh, I think we should pat ourselves on the back. So I just wanted to let you, let the committee know that this was happening. 
Great, that's wonderful news. Yeah. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. So, we so to, do teachers or who's using the radios? Administrators? Yeah, they'll be they'll be mo admin mostly administrators. Okay. Excellent. And and office personnel. Right. So there you go. That's it. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. All right. So next on the agenda is public comment, and I just want to read um, our school committee policy on that. Public comment. Um, the Duxbury School Committee welcomes public comment and participation at school committee meetings. Um, members of the community can address issues of concern about policy, budget, or administrative matters, or simply share, share ideas about how we we can work together to improve the Duxbury Public Schools. We value your import and input, how am I doing, and respect divergent views. We only ask that you limit your remarks to two minutes and refrain from airing grievances about individual members of the school committee or the school community. It's not a back and forth, so I know some people want it to be sort of a Q&A. It's not a Q&A. It's just um, you can give your input. So if folks have something to say, if they could go down the bottom where it says participants and raise their hand. Okay, looks like we have uh, Kate Bunnell. Hello, Kate. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to come on and just make a comment and commend the students at Duxbury High School. They have been fabulous. Uh, over the past few weeks, they have adjusted to the masks, the one-way traffic in the hallways, changes to lunch, and all of the technology that we are using to teach in person and remote simultaneously. They have been so patient with me and with the staff as we navigate to do everything differently. Um, they're fabulous. They reach out when they have questions instead of getting frustrated. And uh, they've made me really happy to be back. So um, our theme this year at the High School for Student Council is Ignite Change. And while these are many changes that they didn't ask for, um, they have just been adjusting really well. And as a staff member, I just wanted to make a public remark that I really appreciate all, all the things that they're doing to make us happy at the high school. That's all. Thanks, Kate. No problem. Thank we you, guys. We appreciate Thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks. Kelly got um, kicked off Zoom again. So I don't see any other <clears throat> hands. Any up. other uh, comments or questions from the attendees? Looks like uh, Cleary, C. Leary. Yep, here we go. Okay. Hello. Hi, it's Katie Cleary. Um, I had a question and it's probably deeper than they can go, you can go tonight, but um, Peter, my husband and I listened to what you said about the funding and the school issues. And, um, you know, we agree, we moved here purely for education. Like neither of us have any connection to this town. Um, but I guess you, you say it's on the citizens and I, I'm just trying to better understand that from, uh, from a citizen and um you know as far as we understand the process it you know it goes to the finance committee and it's town meeting and it's budgets but um again i know this doesn't have a lot to do with the actual meeting tonight i just felt like i needed to ask because i'm i'm obviously always looking to like circle the wagons and try to help um in any way we can um I'm just confused in a town with very little business and business tax, like a comparison to Plymouth is, is tough. So I just, from a, a very lay person perspective, I just um, was looking for input on how that whole process works and we can talk offline or if I could email you the question, that's fine. I just wanted to ask it. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. If I, can I just respond to that generally? Um, I think that uh, school committee, uh, Peter is a great advocate for, for our financial position as a school district. And, uh, you know, we're, but 
all the votes for operating budgets and capital budgets come down to town meeting, um, which is a vote of uh, voters in the town. So a school committee, um, no matter how passionately it may support uh, one budget or another, uh, we represent when, when, uh, when the time comes to vote um, on articles at town meeting, we represent five votes. Um, and so the role for parents and community members is, uh, is to supplement uh, those votes um, and, uh, and to indicate their um, wishes uh, in the run up to town meeting by sending emails to finance committee, uh, to the town manager, to the board of selectmen, um, because really no matter what uh, our experience has been that no matter how much advocacy we do as a school committee on behalf of our, um, our budget, what really catches the notice of the town is how many voters are likely to show up and vote at town meeting um, for these articles. And so um, it's really helpful to have parents and community members engage in the process from this point onward, as discussions evolve around the budget um, and as news comes out in the Clipper, uh, those emails um, in prior years have been instrumental in making sure that um, the town understands just how, how committed people are to the school budget. I wanna add one thing and, and um, again, this isn't the, the night to get too deep into this, but in addition to town meeting, I totally agree with Julia. I think she raised a great point. But communities like ours, and, and Katie referenced the fact that we have very limited um, commercial tax base, you know, we, we, we've essentially hit a tipping point in town. And the only way to really get more resources is to infuse more resources in, into the town. And the mechanism in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to do that is with an operational you know, tax override. And you know, tax overrides tend to have a bad reputation, sort of like a four letter word, but the reality is that is your mechanism um, to infuse more resources into your town budget. It, it asks you to override the limitations of Prop two and a half, which we can do some education on that again during the budget process. Um, but that requires advocacy too from community to say to our finance committee and say to the selectmen and say to us that, you know what? We would actually vote at the ballot to raise our taxes to support public schools. That's essentially what it comes down to. So, you know, again, we, we will, we're committed to doing education about that every year, we'll do more, but you ask a great question and um, I think a really important one, but um, we need more money and we don't have the tax base in this town. It's no one's fault. No, we just don't, we actually don't have the tax base to support right now, support public schools. And I'd argue support other town departments who have significant needs as well. So thanks, Katie. All right. That it? That's it. Okay. So our action items are to um, vote on uh, vote to approve the donation of the dugouts at the upper high school and train fields from Ducks for Youth Softball. Yeah, last last November, I think it was November, um, representatives from Ducks for Youth Softball came to us just to present an app um, an application present to the committee an application that they were presenting. Um, to um, the community preservation um, um, fund uh, with uh, committee, right? Community preservation committee um, to build uh, new dugouts, um, one on train field and one on the upper high school field. Uh, and because they're on school property, they were just looking kind of for our uh, blessing, if you will, or your blessing as a committee. And very happy to report that the CPC did approve their project. Um, I think it was $72,000, uh, which is great news um, for them and, and for, our, um, for our facilities as well. And so I think officially we should just kind of accept the donation um, of those dugouts, uh, given that they will land uh, and be built on, on school property. All right, great. So can I have a motion to approve the donation of the dugouts? So moved. Second. All in favor, Julia? Aye. Shannon? Aye. Matt? Aye. Peter? 
You're on mute, Peter. Uh, aye. And Kelly, aye. All right, excellent. Our next meeting is October 7th. And that is it. If uh, Does anybody have anything else? Then I'll take a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor, Julia. Aye. Shannon. Aye. Matt. Aye. Peter. Aye. Kelly, aye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. See you soon. Bye. Thank you.